Hi, good evening, everyone. So, well, so uh, questions can be asked in between by raising hand, or uh, you know, you can ask your question at the end of the session. Okay, guys, good evening. Very good evening. Very good evening. So, I'll ask my team to put off the mics for everyone right now. So I'll take it, I'll take the class and uh, you know, you can raise your hand in between or uh, you know, you can talk to me anytime by raising your hand or by putting the comment in between. Okay, I'll be answering the questions and then uh, we can have a discussions also. So before I start the class, okay, before I start the class, I welcome you guys. Thank you very much for joining this course. And I am very glad to say that there are 800 plus participants in this course, 800 plus participants who are joining this course, uh, you know, who have joined this course through, uh, uh, you know, our, all the platforms. And today also I can see that there are, uh, you know, multiple viewers at, uh, YouTube and around 180 right now, uh, you know, in front of me in the Zoom meeting. Okay, so uh, one more small announcement about, uh, you know, our uh, day after tomorrow, we have, uh, you know, one exam scheduled. So many of you might be, uh, you know, aware of our MCCDP. This is Master's Certificate Course in Diabetic Pharmacotherapy. Many of the students could not attempt the last exam, which was done, uh, you know, in the first week of August, 2nd August. And that day, uh, you know, many of you could not attend the exam because, uh, you know, because of your own reasons, I'll not say that. Okay, but uh, due to the huge number of, uh, uh, you know, the requestees, we came up with the exam again. I requested Gitanjali University Udaipur to conduct this exam once again. So they are conducting this exam again day after tomorrow evening, six o'clock. The link will be sent to the participants' email ID. Okay, whoever has not cleared the exam last time, they can attempt this exam again. Okay, or who did not get the certificate or who did not clear the exam with 60% marks, they have the chance to clear it again. Okay, and who already got the certificate? No need to attempt the exam at all. You do not uh, have to go and attempt this exam again and again. So you can, uh, you know, this is only for the people who could not attempt or, you know, who could not clear with the 60% marks. Okay, so with that, I would, uh, uh, you know, like to start today's class and about today's uh, syllabus, about today's uh, you know about this course. So as we all know in our induction class, I told you there will be six classes, but I really don't think that, uh, you know, how I prepare this uh, because I only have to take all the classes. So I really think that we have to take some more classes. We have to take maybe seven or eight classes because I am including more cases and, uh, you know, I don't want you to learn in fast track. I want you to learn nicely so you can understand everything, whatever, uh, you know, I want to teach you. Okay, so you can understand everything from the cardiology. Okay, you can understand all the things, whatever I am, you know, going to teach you. Okay, so that's 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 my motto uh, through this course. And, you know, whatever four topics and other case reports we are, uh, you know, trying to discuss that you must understand completely. That would be my, uh, you know, motto uh, in these classes. Yes, uh, uh, Hita Patel has raised the hand. Yes, please. Any question? Anything? Okay. So, am I not audible, guys? Really? Am I not audible to her or to everyone? Audible, is uh, Yes, sir. You're audible. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Great. Maybe I'm not audible to her. So please check the network at your end. Uh, Ms. Patel. Okay, so guys, uh, so let, let me share the screen. We'll not, uh, you know, waste much time. Today, I take our first uh, disease that is my favorite and that is my 
super speciality i must say because i have done my phd in uh, you know heart failure i have done my phd in cardiology and super specialized with heart failure because my phd in complete heart failure patients and i have seen all the things i know how the, uh, i mean uh, you know i'll i'll discuss my experiences my personal experiences with you as well uh, you know what i have learned and through my slides also and uh, uh, you know slides are you know just for the name sake but you are going to understand all the things what i have learned and how actually we should practice uh, you know heart failure how we all uh, you know so take care of the heart failure patients and how we also diagnose and you know what are the rational uh, pathologies and symptom signs and everything okay uh, a screen with you guys okay so i hope it is visible for all of you and i request all of you again to you know put off your mics uh, or uh, let me uh, put off your mics then we can uh, you know uh, so i think if i put off all the mics then it won't be uh, you know good because you have to speak sometimes in between sometimes if i'm asking something you can answer so i'm not putting all of you on mute so uh, i'll just put uh, you know the normal so if you have any questions you can please raise your hand and ask me okay and please take care of your videos and audios that it is not uh, disturbing in between and guys today's class is going to be a little long because topic is a big topic you know it's really big topic so this class will be around one and a half hour one and a half hour okay so i hope you i think it's not a big big deal because i already told you that these classes will be a little longer because we have to cover a lot of things okay and heart failure i'm not only going to complete today because it's again a big deal because uh, if i talk about disease only today it will take around one and a half hour to two hours and then there will be one case discussion very important and about the patient counseling so there are very important things which will be left today so i'll be taking one more module on heart failure only okay so let's start guys good evening again so today we are going to talk our first module that is on heart failure so uh let's discuss with the heart failure okay let's discuss with the definition of heart failure okay so what is heart failure generally i'll tell you before to the definitions before going to the technicality i'll tell you in uh, you know the basic terms heart failure is actually the uh, you know failure of pumping okay failure of pumping capacity of the heart so heart actually does pump it pumps the blood to your entire body okay it does pump the blood to your all the body and it gets the blood from your lungs and it does pump the blood to your uh, you know lungs also uh, to get to get uh, you know purified so the major work of heart is to pump the blood throughout the body you know either to the lungs or uh, you know to the whole body uh through the circulation system to the circulatory parts through the you know uh, our arteries and getting back to uh, you know to the heart and send it back to the lungs for purification again by the veins so this is the main uh, you know purpose or main uh, you know task or main function of the heart so how does it work how heart failure has happened so heart failure is the reduction in the pumping capacity of the heart or the failure of pumping capacity okay so sometimes it does happen suddenly uh, you know like uh, a sudden heart failure sometimes it is acute sometimes it is chronic okay so in chronic phase means that the heart capacity would be you know reducing with be coming down slowly you know maybe due to some toxins due to some uh, you know structural heart diseases due to some functional impairments there are multiple things which can uh, you know cause heart failure there are multiple things i'll discuss the etiologies i'll discuss the uh, you know the problems what can actually you know uh, get you the heart the heart failure not heart attack okay so remember one more thing here we are not talk about we are not talking about heart attack heart attack and heart failures are two different conditions two totally different conditions okay maybe intercorrelated but totally different okay heart attack is myocardial infarction where the infarction happened infarction happens in the uh, you know in the myocardial arteries okay myocardial arteries and then the supply of oxygen stops uh, you know or reduces okay that is called heart attack but heart failure is different heart failure is reducing the pumping capacity of the heart 
okay so these two diseases are two different diseases okay two different conditions not the same so today we are going to talk about heart failure and about myocardial infarctions about heart attacks we are going to talk later later means at the end of this course the last two classes i'll be taking on uh, you know myocardial infarctions and the cases of myocardial infarctions but now we are talking about heart failure so uh, you know uh, you understand that uh, heart failure is nothing but reducing the pumping capacity or stopping the pumping capacity of the heart and pumping capacity to the blood okay so it is uh, according to the definitions of acc and aha acc here is american college of cardiology and aha is american heart association so there are only two or three uh, you know organizations in the world okay around the globe only two or three organizations uh, you know which are really big and which are really working towards the uh, cardiac conditions and we all we all follow their guidelines around the world there are only two three and we follow their guidelines like one is european society of cardiology one of the biggest uh, you know society and we all around the world we follow the esc guidelines of uh, you know cardiac conditions different different cardiac conditions esc has different different committees which prepares uh, you know that committee prepares uh, you know prepare the different guidelines like for myocardial infarction for ischemia for ischemia for heart failure for rheumatic heart disease for you know uh, different arrhythmias for uh, you know different congenital anomalies different congenital heart problems many things okay so they prepare the guidelines and uh, you know they conduct conferences workshops they, they are like biggest societies in the world like one is european society of cardiology another one is american college of cardiology and american heart association okay so usually american heart association and american college of cardiology they work together okay american cardiac uh, you know american college of cardiology and american heart association these two work usually together and they combinedly come up with the guidelines for cardiac conditions and for hypertension for rheumatic heart disease i mean for everything okay so this is like uh, you know for america and uh, you know for us or uh, for europe there are different different guidelines but this is not only the thing europe uh, you know still follows uh, acc acha guidelines and americans follow esc guidelines i mean everyone in the world they follow these two guidelines because these two guidelines are are standard okay are standard so here um, according to american college of cardiology and american heart association guidelines heart failure as a complex clinical syndrome okay this is a complex clinical syndrome why it is a complex clinical syndrome because i'll tell there are multiple signs and symptoms there are multiple involvements of structural and or functional impairments okay structural impairment means it starts with sometimes a structural impairment in the heart maybe due to uh, you know rheumatic heart disease due to maybe a uh, heart attack as i am telling you know due to myocardial infarctions due to uh, you know the uh, left ventricular functions due to the right ventricular uh, you know dysfunctions so multiple anomalies are there maybe due to uh, you know vsds rhds valvular problems so that results from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of the blood so ventricular filling as we all know how blood circulates in the heart how blood uh, you know goes through the heart how it goes through the heart first it comes to the right atrium right first it comes to the right atrium it goes to the right ventricle right if i'm not wrong okay then from right ventricle it goes to the lungs from lungs it goes to you know it comes back to the left atrium and from left atrium it goes to the left ventricle and from left ventricle it goes to the body to the entire body okay through the uh, you know our aorta right through our aorta and it comes comes through the vena cava and uh, you all know that uh, you know there are the uh, circulatory system or uh, you know the arteries and veins uh, which works totally opposite between heart and lungs so uh, between heart and lungs how it works like you know the arteries takes the uh you know unpurified blood and veins take uh you know take the purified blood from the lungs back to the heart usually the arteries are you know uh, which are taking the blood from heart to entire body and veins are which are uh, you know taking the blood the uh, uh, unpurified blood uh, back to the heart right it happens you it happens this way but between uh, heart and lungs it is opposite because veins take backs uh, you know uh, takes the uh, purified blood and 
arteries takes the uh, you know unpurified blood to the lungs right so that happens in uh, case of uh, you know when it comes between the heart and lungs so uh, here the problem could be anywhere problem could be anywhere what we are talking about structural or functional problem right we are talking about structural or functional impairment so it can happen anywhere from the right atrium to the left ventricle right atrium right uh, you know ventricle or left atrium left ventricle or their septums or their you know valvular problems or their valvular structures anywhere it can happen okay so this is a complex clinical syndrome which results from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of the blood right according to european society of cardiology the same thing okay they have told the same thing but it is in the elaborated way elaborated definition of heart failure so that means again the heart failure is a clinical syndrome characterized by typical symptoms so what are the typical symptoms of heart failure guys typical symptoms of heart failure are first is breathlessness okay so usually we have breathlessness i'll tell you here uh, the other conditions also I'll, I'll i'll tell you all about all the things which we can rule out okay so when we are talking about breathlessness usually we get the breathlessness in our asthmatic patients in our uh, you know copd patients or in our rheumatic heart disease patients or uh, you know there are other multiple conditions like anemia okay anemia also we get the breathlessness but the breathlessness is one of the standard symptom or one of the typical symptom typical means standard symptom typical means the major symptom okay remember this when we talk about typical symptoms means the standard the uh, you know signature symptoms or signature signs okay so typical symptoms means the signature symptoms of heart failure are breathlessness ankle swelling which we call edema also so usually edema below your knees at your ankles are very important in heart attack sorry in heart failure patients there are the edemas okay in heart uh, heart failure patients there are the edemas right so and the fatigue so again as i'm ta uh, talking about you know different symptoms and different you know conditions fatigue also could be in anemic patients fatigue could be uh, you know uh, due to some other problems vitamin deficiencies vitamin d deficiencies or uh, you know any other conditions it could be fatigue could be uh, you know due to any other condition also but again fatigue is also one of the uh, you know uh, typical symptom of heart failure okay so heart failure is a clinical syndrome characterized by typical symptoms that may be accompanied by signs okay so accompanied by signs what are the signs of heart failure elevated jugular vein pressure okay elevated jugular vein pressure so what is jugular vein pressure jugular vein pressure is again you know there are the veins which brings the blood which brings the blood there are the arteries which brings the blood from heart to the brain okay to the brain right and jugular veins means there are the veins there are the veins which takes the blood back to the heart from the brain okay so in that only there are the jugular veins in right side and left side both both side of your neck there are the jugular veins so when you have the heart failure when any patients have the heart failure jugular veins are measurable outside the neck and jugular vein pressure is really high so due to the pressure we can see the extension of jugular veins okay usually here usually here if you can see uh, through the camera usually here there are the jugular veins and when the patients have heart failure the jugular veins are coming out of the neck and pumping you know you can you can sense that pumping you can see the extension okay so these are the jugular veins in heart failure patients you can easily saw these you can easily see these jugular vein extension okay so this is called elevated jugular vein jugular veins pressure jugular venous pressure okay and then pulmonary crackles pulmonary crackles are uh, like you know the sound of uh, you know breaking the uh, what we say breaking the chips okay or uh, you know breaking the woods uh, you know something kind of that so you can find out that crackle sound in your uh, you know uh, uh, in your lungs in your lungs whenever you check those uh, patients with the stethoscope or you know usually with the ear also you can hear because those are really loud okay so you can really see those you can really hear those pulmonary crackles when you check a typical heart failure patient when you uh, you know see a chronic heart failure patients you get through the pulmonary crackles also okay and then peripheral edema as i'm telling peripheral edema is one of the uh, you know sign and symptom of 
uh, heart failure. You can see, uh, you know, the edemas at your, you know, around your neck, or uh, you're usually at the face, uh, you know, not moon-like face, but sometimes at the face because of, uh, you know, the fluid overload, because of the fluid overload, because in heart failure, your urine retention is not, urine excretion is not completely out because there is the urine, there is a sodium water retention in heart failure. Okay, so I will, I'll come to the pathophysiology, but I'll tell you, so due to that, there is a fluid overload in your body and that can seen, that can be seen by the edema, okay, during, uh, you know, edema, during the heart failure phases in your, uh, you know, ankles, uh, below or at your face sometimes at your hands sometimes okay so that edema can be seen easily okay so this can be caused these all things sign and symptoms can be caused by a structural or the functional cardiac anomaly understand so the same thing same definition but elaborated heart failure is a clinical syndrome characterized by typical symptoms that may be accompanied by signs caused by the structural or a functional cardiac abnormality reducing in a cardiac output okay in a reduced cardiac output and or elevated intracardiac pressures at the rest or during stress during stress that's very important usually usually we have people who are you know really good who are well who do not have the symptoms when they are in the resting phase okay there are the patients who are in the resting phase and they do not have the problem but usually heart failure patients when they are in the you know uh, NYHA class 3 or NYHA class 4, they have the symptoms even during the resting phase, okay? And definitely when they are working, when they are in the stress, they definitely show the symptoms, guys, okay? So let's go to the uh, next slide. So what are the structural differences, okay? First of all, I'll tell you, there are the three types of heart failure, okay? I'll, uh, before, uh, you know, explaining this slide, I would like to tell you there are the three types of heart failure, okay? Three types of heart failure based on the ejection fraction okay based on the ejection fraction and based on the normal functions of the heart okay so first is normal function okay normal function okay of the heart where you know there are no enlargement systolic and diastolic functions are very really well okay Fun diastolic and systolic functions are really well so this is a normal condition but there are another three, three types of heart failure based on the ejection fraction and based on the function, there are two types of heart failure. We can say one is systolic dysfunction, one is diastolic dysfunction, okay? So, uh, you know, the heart failure based on the ejection fraction, one is where your ejection fraction is normal, okay? Uh, ejection fraction is something, I'll tell you, the measurement of your cardiac output, okay? Measurement of the cardiac output, or we can say the pumping capacity. Measurement of the pumping capacity is called ejection fraction okay that can be uh, you know checked by uh, you know echocardiogram okay that can be checked by echocardiogram uh, so uh, the ejection fraction is the actual measurement for you know for heart failure to dis uh, to uh, you know distinguish the heart failure uh, like what kind of heart failure it is whether it is a diastolic heart failure whether it is a systolic heart failure or whether it is a mid uh, you know like a mid range ejection fraction heart failure so uh, let's understand this uh, classification first, okay? Before explaining this slide, let's uh, you know understand this classification. One is based on the functional or structural problems, okay? Based on the structural problems or functional dysfunctions, okay? That is like systolic dysfunction and diastolic dysfunction, okay? Systolic dysfunction or systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure, understand? Systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure. But ejection fraction, if we come to the ejection fraction, there are three types. One is heart failure with normal ejection fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Heart failure with, we call it, when the ejection fraction is normal, we call it heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Preserved means there is no deterioration in the ejection fraction, but there are the heart failure symptoms and there are the heart failure signs and there are the structural problems, other structural problems, but the ejection fraction is intact. This is more than 50%. So the normal ejection fraction is 50, I mean, more than 50%, 50 to 68% actually, but it is more than 50% is, uh, I mean, uh, the ejection fraction of more than 50% is called normal ejection fraction, okay? Normal pumping capacity. Once it comes down from the 50, that, that time we can distinguish again 
it to two types one is mid range ejection fraction and one is reduced ejection fraction before 2017 before 2017 or uh, you know uh, that was a uh, you know uh, that was not the distinct uh, this third category was not completely separated the third category is mid range ejection fraction okay the third category is mid range ejection fraction that was not completely clear that was not completely uh, you know differentiated it from others okay so before 2017 actually before 2013 there was only two types based on the ejection fraction also there was two types of heart failure one is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where ejection fraction was more than 50 and one was heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that was less than 50% but from 2013 to 2017 they kept one more gray area in between like 50% to 40% okay 50% like 49% to 40% that was a gray area that gray area was called as uh, you know like it was a gray area after 2017 they gave it a proper name that is called as heart failure with mid range ejection fraction okay i'll i'll come to that i'll, I'll tell you why it had happened okay but uh, you know and then less than 40% of the ejection fraction is called as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction hf pf hf pef okay heart failure with preserved ejection fraction heart failure with mid range ejection fraction hf mdrf okay mdef and then again uh, you know hf ref hf r reduced ejection fraction reduced ef okay so hf pf hf ref and hf ref okay that is i mean uh, uh, the short terms the abbreviations we usually use but i mean you don't have to use you can directly you know say the full name heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or heart failure with mid range ejection fraction or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction okay so i was talking about the gray area so that gray area how it has happened and how it came to the existence because this uh, you know usual usually either it is a normal function heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where ejection fraction is normal but there are the structural changes okay or there are the severe dysfunctions i mean the structural dysfunctions and the ejection fraction has come down really 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 down okay means less than 40 so it was called reduced ejection fraction but you know in heart attack patients in myocardial infarction patients in heart attack patients i'm talking about heart heart attack now in heart attack patients in myocardial infarction patients usually what happens due to due to the sudden oxygen cut or due to the sudden reduction in the oxygen heart the pumping capacity of the heart the ejection fraction also comes down for some time due to the infarction due to the pumping capacity i mean due to the oxygen supply and due to the uh, you know uh, what we say it conduction system there are multiple systems which involves in heart attack also during uh, you know myocardial infarction so due to those structural changes sudden structural changes due to heart attack you know there is a certain reduction in ejection fraction also okay so that is not exactly heart failure because that can be recovered okay that can be recovered that can be recovered so that's why they kept this area for some time for 3 years 4 years they kept as a gray area they were defining whether it is actually heart failure or whether it could be uh, you know recoverable after some medicines after some therapies after uh, you know uh, implantable defibrillators or after surgical uh you know things after correcting the comorbidities if it can be you know uh, it can come to normal okay they were saying and they they thought like okay let's give the distinguished category okay that category is mid range ejection fraction heart failure with mid range ejection fraction usually the major the major cause of that mid range ejection fraction is heart attack is myocardial infarctions okay 4% of the heart failure with mid range ejection fraction happens or developed due to heart attack due to myocardial infarction that's why it is a separate category okay still that is under controversy that category is still under controversy but there is still you know there are thousands of the research papers thousands of the clinical trials are going on around the world to just testify whether that is actually uh, you know ischemia it's ischemic heart failure that is due to ischemia ischemia means the myocardial infarction due to the cardiovascular problems due to the uh, you know a sudden heart attack due to the acute coronary artery disease 
whether it is due to that or whether it is really the heart failure. So till date, whatever research says, whatever the etiology uh, says, whatever the prevalence of etiology says, like majority of the mid-range ejection fractions, the 64% is due to heart attacks, due to myocardial infractions. So that's why that is a different area for the research. Okay, now there are two major areas. One is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where ejection fraction is normal, but that is true heart failure. Another area is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That is again less than 40 of the EF and there are the structural changes. So now in this slide, we are talking about those. One is systolic dysfunction, one is diastolic dysfunction, okay? So, and we are comparing here it with the normal heart. Okay, you can see, uh, you know, in the left, let me take, wait, power pointer. Let me take the pointer, yeah. So, see here, it is a normal heart. Look at this, right atrium, perfect, okay. Diastolic, fully filling, full filling, okay. And then right ventricle, there is a great flow and it is filling completely. Okay, and then sending the blood to the lungs and then left atrium receiving the blood from uh, lungs completely and the valvular opening is 100% correct and left ventricle is also okay. And here the chambers are intact. Intact means are in the proper shape. Okay, in the normal function, chambers are in the proper shape, right? And then if you look at this, if you look at this, Again, in the systolic, when it is pumping, it is pumping correctly. In pumping, actually, what happens when they are pump, when there is a pumping, uh, you know, usually these our ventricles, okay, left ventricle and right ventricle, they get constriction, they get constrict, and the blood goes out from the chambers. Blood goes out from the chambers, whether it is going to the uh, lung or whether it is going to the uh, aorta to the whole system to the whole body okay so in that time there is a constriction in the uh you know our ventricles okay that that is called systole that is called pumping okay that is called pumping or systole this is perfectly normal in the normal heart now let's come to the systolic dysfunction systolic dysfunction means there is the enlargement in ventricles when it is filling with the blood okay so here you have to understand guys, you have to understand the filling, the filling is proper, proper. And even the amount of blood is high. Okay, amount of blood is little higher than the normal. Okay, amount of the blood is little higher, but due to the enlargement of ventricle, the constriction cannot happen properly and the blood, and the blood which usually, you know, is 60%, in the pumping, when it happens, the pumping happens when the systole happens, and usually the 60% of the blood of uh, you know our ventricles goes out to the whole body, okay, or to the lungs. But in this case, in systolic dysfunction, due to the enlargement of the ventricles, due to the enlargement of the ventricles, only 40 to 50 percent of the blood goes out. Okay, see, only 40 to 50 percent blood goes out because it cannot constrict nicely it cannot constrict properly i hope you understand here in diastolic function in systolic functions blood amount is proper amount of blood is normal in the ventricles but because of the enlargement because of the enlargement they cannot constrict properly and the blood cannot go proper in the proper amount okay so it is just 40 to 50 percent so you understand the pumping capacity has reduced here, okay? That is called systolic dysfunction. In diastolic dysfunction, it is totally ulta. There, there are the stiffness. There is the stiffness of ventricles. When they're filling up with the blood, when they're filling up with the blood, the amount of blood is less because now they cannot relax properly, okay? In the ventricles, in the ventricles, the wall, the ventricles cannot expand properly and the amount of blood is really, really less. Here, the pumping is about 60%, but the amount of the blood is less. So the amount of the blood which is going out is also less. So when amount of the blood is going out less means the amount of oxygen is also going out less, right? So that is the problem. In diastolic dysfunctions, the amount of blood is less due to, because, I mean, due to that, uh, you know, the stiffness of the wall, due to the stiffness of the ventricles. But in systolic dysfunction, amount of blood is 
good amount of blood is good but due to the constriction problem amount of the blood which is needed which is sufficient to supply the proper uh, you know oxygen is not good is not proper is not complete okay is not enough okay so understand here in diastolic that amount of the blood is less but the pumping capacity is normal amount of the blood is less because the amount of the blood which was needed could not come to the ventricles due to the stiffness of the wall and that expansion cannot could not happen the relaxation could not happen so this is totally ulta in systolic dysfunctions con uh, you know the contraction is not good okay in diastolic dysfunction that uh, uh, you know expansion or relaxation is not proper understand so that's why the amount of blood anyhow in any ways whether it is uh, you know due to constriction due to uh, you know contraction or due to maybe uh, you know the expansion or relaxation amount of the blood which is going out is really less okay whether your pumping capacity is normal or not normal it is going out okay so let's go to the next slide here as i was discussing heart failure with residual external fraction is less than 40 percent so uh, you know how to define the criteria how to define there is no need to you know go for any specific test uh, you know any specific test only you can check the ejection fraction with the help of echocardiogram and you can find out if the ejection fraction is less than 40. If the ejection fraction is less than 40, you can directly, uh, you know, uh, diagnose the patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is half ref. Okay. And if there is the ejection fraction somewhere between 40 to 49%, 40 to 49%, then sign and symptoms are needed to diagnose. And additionally, we need the biomarker and biomarker for heart failure is only one that is anti pro bnp natriuretic pro bnp bnp is brain natriuretic pro peptides okay brain natriuretic uh, natriuretic peptides okay brain uh, natriuretic peptide so anti pro bnp is n terminal so uh, this is the n terminal of uh, you know bnps so n terminal of pro bnps like anti pro bnp is the biomarker specific biomarker for heart failure that is needed when you are going to diagnose the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or with the uh, you know heart failure with uh, mid-range ejection fraction you have to diagnose the heart failure with proper biomarkers and the biomarker is ng pro bnp okay janvi patel has a question sir how to measure ejection fraction which test is performed echocardiogram is the test uh, to you know uh, check the uh, ejection fraction echocardiogram eco we call it eco so echocardiogram is the test uh, uh, by which we can check multiple things we can check ejection fraction we can calculate all these lvh or le lvh is nothing left ventricular hypertrophy or left atrium enlargement which is uh, or you know la is left atrium enlargement so there are multiple things which you can uh, you know definitely check out by eco so only two things major things to diagnose the heart failure are anti pro bnp and echocardiogram these two things are very very important if you have these two things you can diagnose any kind of heart failure yes and navin patra has raised the hand someone something okay so along with that when we are talking about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where the ejection fraction is totally normal less than uh, you know it is more than 50 not less than it is more than 50 so here see you are now uh, clueless you are now clueless in case of ejection fraction because ejection fraction is normal but if the patient has the typical sign and symptoms, you must go for the additional criteria. What is additional criteria? Additional criteria is again anti pro BNP. Anti pro BNP must be raised. And I'll tell you what are the ranges of, uh, you know, uh, anti pro BNPs. I'll tell you those things. And in the eco, if, eject, if ejection fraction is normal, you must go for the, you know, in depth. In depth means you must go for the structural changes. Structural changes means diastolic dysfunction or LVH or LAE. LVH is left ventricular hypertrophy and LAE is left atrium enlargement. Enlargement of left atrium and, you know, hypertrophy of left ventricle. These are the major things what you should go for echo and uh, go for echo and go, go to check in the echo actually. Okay, so then based on this, you can definitely define the ejection fraction or uh, you know define the heart failure actually and you can define you can classify the heart failure into these three criteria into these three uh, you know class classes 
okay so someone is uh, having some question here in the chat box let me see okay so which echo whether it is 2d or 3d actually 2d echo is enough to diagnose the heart failure 3d echo is for uh, you know structural heart diseases or for uh, you know any kind of rheumatic heart problems or you know valvular heart problems then in that case you need 3d echo but nowadays 3d echo is also helpful but heart failure can be diagnosed by the 2d echo itself okay there is no need of uh, you know a specific 3d echoes but if you are in the heart failure with preserved ejection fractions and you need to go for uh, you know further investigations then you can go for 3d echo 3d echo will give you the basic uh, you know very basic information as well so uh, but 2d echo is more than sufficient in case of heart failure yes uh, janvir's right brain natriuretic peptides okay so anna is asking some question sir by elevated antiproben b what is the level in pg ml okay so this is again I, I was supposed to come to this so let me tell you here only no problem uh, because this is uh, you know what i can speak for a long time so antiproben b is as i told you this is a brain natriuretic peptide there are different different conditions and different different levels of antiproben b this is a big question guys and don't be confused here i, I am not here to confuse you but i'm here to teach you what is very important you should understand that usually the usually the level of antiproben p's must be less than 150 pg per ml okay less than 150 a 150 picogram per ml that is the normal okay but when your patient is in the heart attack when your patient comes with heart attack myocardial infarction you should always consider these are not guidelines there are some guidelines also which says that okay which says that based on the practice based on the practical learnings based on the evidence based practices based on the evidence based uh, you know medicine i'm telling you that you should consider 300 picogram per ml if the patient comes with myocardial infarction okay that is the count otherwise the normal count is 150 picogram per ml for antiproben p and for bnp bnp is again the separate thing antiproben p is the extended version the end terminal of bnp that is more than sufficient and that is the specific biomarker if you are if you are if the antiproben p is not available if you just have the bnp then you can go for 100 level of 100 picogram per ml also for antiproben p the normal level must be less than 150 picogram per ml in heart attack patients in myocardial infarction patients you must consider 300 picogram per ml and now i'll tell you one thing in the patients more than 60 years of the age in the elderly patients again antiproben p levels must be counted more than 300 picogram per ml okay and in the nephro patients in the renal insufficiency patients the patients with renal problems patients with acute or chronic renal problems or you know the grade 3 to grade 5 end stage renal diseases you must consider 900 picogram per ml these are the guidelines says okay when the patient is in you know at least grade 3 to grade 5 of the kidney problem kidney failure then you must consider 900 okay you must consider 900 because antiproben p raises in case of kidney problems also in case of acute kidney failure or chronic kidney failure with the stage of 3 to 5 or end stage renal diseases okay so that is important to remember usually if someone asks you what is the cutoff for antiproven b that is 150 picogram per ml understand guys i hope you understand that okay so cc okay uh Sundar Salim is asking what is CCF and heart failure. See, congenital, uh, see, this is uh, nothing but congestive cardiac failure. Congestive cardiac failure is a stage of heart failure. Okay. Congestive cardiac failure is a stage of heart failure where people, you know, also face the pulmonary edema. Okay. Where people face the pulmonary edema. Okay. And in the acute phase, acute phase of cardiac uh, acute phase of heart failure is called congestive heart failure congestive cardiac failure these are the same thing but at the different levels okay congestive cardiac failure is the heart failure and is one of the stages of heart failure okay yeah so what is the role of troponin t troponin t is not for heart failure troponin t is for heart attack that's why i'm telling you there's a difference between heart attack and heart failure 
heart failure is different heart attack is different heart attack is myocardial infarction so troponin t is the biomarker for infarction when your when uh, there is uh, some infarction in your veins in your arteries uh due to the you know fat content or due to the calcium content or due to the injury then from the vein troponin t or troponin i secretes that time we check the level of troponin t or i that is the biomarker for heart attack for heart failure heart failure biomarker is anti proven b because that is produced by the uh, wall of your heart not from the veins or arteries not from the circulatory system understand that properly okay two distinct biomarkers you are talking about for renal patient we should consider 900 picogram yes for the renal patients whether it is an acute kidney failure or the chronic kidney failure with stage 3 to 5 remember this okay someone is asking what is the test to check troponin level troponin level uh, is i mean the troponin kits are there troponin kits uh, troponin t troponin i kits are there you can check anywhere if you have that and the level of troponin is 0.1 ng per ml nanogram per ml not picogram troponin is always checked in nanograms okay ng per ml so that is different part that we will talk in the different class otherwise you will be confused okay so here i think someone has raised the hand also who was raising the hand please uh, talk if you have any questions any questions want to discuss live or we'll go to the next slide okay no worries we'll go to the next slide i hope everything is clear so now i'll tell you about the symptoms when it comes to the symptoms we check the symptoms of heart failure through the nyha functional class remember guys this is the another classification for heart failure or for cardiac functions for cardiac patients we usually check the nyha functional class okay especially in heart failure patients we check this nyha functional class nyha functional class is nothing but new york heart association okay this is a very small organization in america itself because we all have you know the different different organizations so in india uh, uh, we have uh, you know our world youth heart federation uh, and uh, we have world heart federation in the world we have different different organizations in different different countries societies you know uh, indian societies there indian uh, you know what is that um, society's name i forgot that that is uh, you know again the cardiac society of india csi okay so there are the societies they have their own uh, you know things so this nyha new york function new york heart association came up with a wonderful classification for the symptoms of cardiac problems especially for the heart failure and that is called as new york heart association functional class so new york heart association functional class one says there is no limitation for physical activities these are actually the severity classes for cardiac patients how severe are the conditions how severe are the conditions for heart failure patients if the heart failure patient has no limitation for physical activities that could be considered in nyha functional class 1 okay and that could be considered also as that the patient is in the normal conditions normal conditions means maybe uh, you know the heart failure initiation or something okay the nyha functional class 2 says slight limitation symptoms at ordinary activities comfortable at rest remember this slight limitations means there are slight limitations while maybe uh, you know taking bath or you know walking hard or maybe uh, you know lifting a little little weight or uh, you know maybe uh, you know climbing stairs there are multiple things slight limitations are there symptoms are appearing on the ordinary uh you know activities at the ordinary activities but these all are comfortable the patient guest patient get comfort at the rest there are no symptoms there are no limitations at the rest that is called you know nyha functional class 2 when the patient is in nyha functional class 3 for the symptoms there are remarkable limitations symptoms at the routine activities also you know if the patient is normally uh like walking also or uh, you know something normal activities not hard activities like weight lifting climbing stairs or something but uh, with the normal activities like wearing clothes okay wearing clothes or combing or if the patient is having symptoms at those routine activities also and that those limitations are remarkable limitations remarkable limitations means that the patient cannot do the patient can do but but with the symptoms with the typical sign and symptoms 
patient will appear with the breathlessness patient will get the severe fatigue at that time okay so that is called remarkable limitations if the patient is showing remarkable limitations symptoms at the routine activities and the patient gets comfort at the rest that is called noh function class 3 Functional class four says the patient is in severe condition because the patient is totally unable to do the routine activities. Even there are no rest, no symptom. I mean, there are no comfort at rest. The symptoms are appearing even at the rest. So the NYHA functional classes are actually the severity classes or the symptoms classes for uh, you know heart failure or for other cardiac conditions also we usually consider nyh class sometimes but these are especially for the heart failure okay there are four classes nyh class one two three four so based on that you can divide the patients you can classify the patients based on those you know symptoms appearances and all okay now etiologies of heart failure so there are the etiologies okay there are the etiologies so the major problem major problems are appearing by two ways one is by cardiac or myocardial damage and another are by the abnormal loading conditions abnormal loading conditions means the abnormal you know flow of the heart through the circulation system or flow of the blood through the heart okay through the you know flow of the blood through the uh, through the heart the circulatory system is damaged by the other abnormal conditions i'll tell you how and first thing is myocardial damage so due to myocardial damage definitely you can understand that ischemic heart disease is one of the main reason i mean the heart failure uh, i mean the heart attack or uh, you know the cardiovascular uh, other cardiovascular problems like uh, you know maybe acute cardiac conditions or uh, you know uh, any kind of myocardial infarction ischemic ischemia ischemia is a major problem for you know heart failure why it is uh, you know a major problem for heart failure i'll tell you guys how it contributes ischemia means that there is a block in your artery there is a block in your cardiac artery there is a block in your heart artery so there if there is a block there is no proper supply of oxygen if there is no proper supply of oxygen to the ventricular wall or the atrium wall or to the cardiac wall okay if there is no proper supply of oxygen to the cardiac wall then the contraction and relaxation will not happen properly okay that will not happen properly that's why we need proper oxygen to the entire heart and that can be possible if our veins and arteries are not blocked okay in case of artery uh, in uh, you know uh, ischemia we get that condition in case of heart attack we get that conditions and suddenly uh, either the flow of oxygen stops or the you know amount of sufficient oxygen stops or reduced so in that case we usually get heart failure okay and that was the condition people are still researching and still looking for whether the heart failure with mid range ejection fraction is totally ischemic heart failure or it is actual heart failure understand that now you can connect it okay so uh, the etiology of heart failure could be ischemic heart disease or maybe toxic damage maybe due to the poisonous substances due to the external substances like due to the calcium due to the fat contents this ischemia can happen due to anything immune immune mediated inflammatory damage maybe in, you know uh, the after you know severe uh, infections in the body after severe infections of the uh, in the body or uh, you know severe inflammatory conditions in the body people usually get heart failure metabolic derangements like diabetes is one of the major reason for heart failure for heart attack also for heart failure also obesity major reason okay obesity and uh, you know diabetes mellitus these two metabolic derangements are the major causes major etiologies for heart failure genetic abnormalities of course genetic abnormalities like you know congenital heart problems or you know congenital anomalies or you know uh, heart anomalies in the kids they usually get heart failure due to that okay and abnormal loading conditions heart hypertension hypertension is again one of the major condition for you know uh, heart failures and there is a specific condition there is a specific condition called hypertensive heart failure hypertensive heart failure hhf that condition is called hhf why it is happening because when hypertension uh, you know when your blood pressure raises up to more than 180 or uh, that is called a hypertension emergency also in another condition that is called also called as hypertension urgency hypertensive urgency or hypertensive emergency in that condition also your 
blood uh, you know your you know the circulation of the blood or the pumping of the blood gets uh, you know affected and you get heart failure or the patient gets heart failure in that case also so that is also called as hypertensive heart failure okay so hypertension is another major region for heart failure and there are the valves and myocardial st structure defects like you know uh, there could be vsds ventricular septum disease ventricular septal disease ventricular arterial disease arterial septal disease asds okay there are the valvular diseases uh, valvular disease may be rheumatic heart disease so multiple problems could do that damage volume overload volume overload could be you know one of the uh, one of the region volume overload and high state outputs or how high output states are the symptoms or are the outputs of kidney problems so again renal problems renal problems means renal insufficiencies means the kidney failure is one of the most uh, you know one of the major region uh, you know with hypertension and ischemic heart failure this is again one of the major region for heart failure along with these reasons okay kidney problems so here the risk of heart failures okay i mean risk of heart failure are these so understand this very very this these these things are very important these are the things where you can understand easily what are the proper things for heart failure okay is there any chance to get a hypertension as a heart failure comorbidity heart failure patients usually get hypotension but not hypertension but hypertensive patients usually get heart attack i mean heart failure okay so hypertension is one of the major etiology for heart failure but the patients who have heart failure are very rare to get hypertension because they are all they are always on hyper anti hypertensives because uh, nowadays uh, i'll come to the medicine uh, of the heart failure nowadays you know your major hypertensive medicines are major heart failure medicines okay okay so what's the difference between heart attack and heart failure i told you and i'll tell you heart failure is the pumping capacity reducing the pumping capacity heart attack is the stopping of sufficient oxygen supply to the cardiac uh, you know setup or to the you know different parts of the heart okay that is because of the block in your heart okay block block in your coronary artery or block in your you know coronary uh, you know other uh, you know uh, capillaries okay so that is due to that so different uh, the, these two are the dis dif different and distinct entities guys don't confuse with heart attack and heart failure okay so risk factor of heart failure we can see by two uh, different terms one is already having a disease that damages the heart coronary heart disease i told you if the patient is already uh you know got any kind of heart attack any kind of myocardial infarction they are more prone to develop heart failure more prone to develop heart failure guys okay high blood pressure hypertensive patients are more prone to get hyper uh, you know heart failure valvular heart disease i means any kind of valve function any kind of valve dysfunction maybe by either it is you know mitral valve or you know tricuspid valve uh, you know bicuspid valve any kind of valvular dysfunction if there is a valvular dysfunction that means there is no proper filling of blood in the chambers in the heart chambers so that can directly lead to heart failure infections as i told you inflammatory conditions can damage the myocardium or can damage the you know your uh, then can can cause the infarction okay so in, infections are one of the most major reason heart failure caused by chemotherapy is one of the major chemotherapy patients more than 50% of the chemotherapy patients develop either heart failure or heart attack because chemotherapy directly affect your heart affect your cardiac functions okay and then there are sometimes the pregnancy related heart failure okay there are sometimes increased heart rate heart failure that is due to bradycardia or tachycardia okay tachycardia means another arrhythmia arrhythmia also can cause the heart failure because the arrhythmias are the conduction system when the conduction system of the heart is damaged again there is no proper supply of the blood or proper uh, you know contraction and proper you know relaxation there is no proper contraction or relaxation okay then it can develop by the unknown causes as i told you the toxins or you know maybe other underlying problems and then the major part unhealthy behaviors sedentary lifestyle sedentary lifestyle guys obese women have a 50% greater risk of heart failure than women of normal weight so obesity sedentary lifestyle excess amount of sodium and fluid can lead to fluid build up in the organs and tissue 
causing swelling that is called edema so you should always look at eliminating or reduce the added salts to the fluid as uh, to the foods okay always restrict your salt high amount of salt can cause heart failure high hypertension and heart failure both okay so don't eat excess masalas excess amount of salt at all excess amount of sodium always you know causes the sodium retention if you have you know studies the ras system r a s system renin angiotensin aldosterone system you must understand the sodium retention in your body and if you are building up your fluid uh you know in your organs in your body you are going to get heart failure easily so i mean these are uh, you know we always should restrict our salt intake we always should restrict our fluid intake so limited fluid intake is 2 liters to 5 liters usually we say in the man 4 liters but still you know the you should always restrict your salt fluid okay but you know when you are healthy you should always restrict your salt intake in your to your body okay and then alcohol and drug abuses definitely these are the toxins which can damage your cardiac uh, you know wall which can damage your cardiac arteries which can damage your you know cardiac functions so these are the risk factors for heart failure guys okay then this is the pathophysiology as i was talking about the ras system uh, which is uh, nothing but your renin angiotensin aldosterone system if there is a problem see reduced cardiac output from the heart failure how it can happen and how it can develop to the heart failure actually reduced cardiac output okay this is a cycle pathophysiology is a cycle the reduced output due to vascular problems due to myocardial infarction due to uh, insufficient supply of oxygen due to conduction system due to multiple other problems so then carotid baroreceptor response is there in your carotid is the artery okay and it is directly linked to your sympathetic nervous system okay once your sympathetic nervous system is not correct once your sympathetic nervous system is not okay it increases your heart rate okay uh, it increases your heart rate and it works on it affects the myocardial contraction that is called inotropy okay it increases the heart rate sympathetic nervous system definitely it uh, you know it is related to your stress anxiety sometimes depression and once your sympathetic nervous system is activated it increases your heart rate and it has the effect on myocardial contraction and then myocardial contraction means your vasoconstriction and vasoconstriction means your blood pressure will be definitely increased and once your blood pressure is increased your after load of the heart will increase means the pumping capacity will be really really you know affected by the raised blood pressure because there will be the pressure to throw the blood out of your ventricles your art you know atriums and that could damage your heart walls that could damage your atrium or ventricular wall okay that is one thing second thing is which is starting from the kidney okay once you have a reduced output due to any reasons due to any problems then there is the activation of res system which is renin angiotensin uh, you know uh, aldosterone system due to it could be due to the low renal perfusion also renal problems also due to the hypertension also due to the high salt intake also and when the it when the ras system is activated in your kidney remember this ras system is activated in your kidney then it 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 releases the renin okay it releases the renin and it goes to your lungs in lungs angiotensin renin actually converts the angiotensin angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 okay the renin it converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 and then in the lungs only angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 okay renin actually gets secreted from the kidney okay it goes to the blood circulation converts angiotensin into angiotensin 1 lungs angiotensin converts into angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme and then this angiotensin plays a major role in your aldosterone system i mean with your aldosterone at your you know pituitary gland and uh, you know it works it works with fluid retention in your body it, it 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 you know it holds back the sodium it holds back the water in your body and that causes heart failure that causes the actual heart failure okay and in adrenal glands it secretes aldosterone and aldosterone again indirectly 
you know goes to the sodium and fluid retention and it causes myopi myocardial fibrosis also which is the very severe condition of you know heart and that is actually uh, you know called the heart failure heart failure is nothing but as i told you structural and functional you know problems functional dysfunctions in your heart so this is like a negative remodeling of your heart and worsening the left ventricular functions it is you know uh, negative remodeling it is causing the problems to your ventricle uh, left ventricle majorly okay that is the major pathophysiology of the heart failure that's how the heart failure uh, you know develops in the body that develops in the patients through these symptoms major activities are your sympathetic sympathetic nervous system and then kidney so why we are talking about kidney here activation of ras system because hypertension directly works on ras system okay all the problems myocardial infarction works on ras system okay many other problems works on kidney and this affects the kidney directly and then it is activating the ras system and once the ras system is activated it causes the multiple problems it causes the fluid retention at the end and uh, you can understand that fluid retention always causes the negative remodeling of the heart okay so there are the questions why using pioglitazone for prolonged period of time may cause heart failure in sometimes some patients okay that is uh, that, that is a lovely question why pioglitazone so uh, you know i'll not answer this question here because that is uh, you know that usually pioglitazone causes heart attack and heart failure both and that is not a cardio protective so i'll give you the assignment uh, you know you can come up with that question and you can discuss in the group also why pioglitazone causes the heart failure or heart attack okay sir here fluid represents water yes fluid represents water only and you know water along with all the other fluids definitely in heart failure patients we restrict fluid in heart failure patients we restrict fluid that is the major major precaution i'm not talking about the healthy people here guys don't worry but in healthy people also you should always avoid high salt intake high masala intake everything okay you should not be in the sedentary lifestyle you could have seen that how these things can you know stimulate uh, your body to develop different cardiovascular problems okay so now diagnosis very important thing diagnosis we have discussed already there are the typical symptoms there are the typical signs there are the uh, you know based on that you can diagnose uh, heart failure as i told you so if you have this, if someone comes with the suspected heart failure suspected heart failure means some patient comes to the cardiology and he says sir i am having this problem i feel i am having such a uh, you know uh some problems like this near fatigue or something and you are suspecting that is heart failure so first of all what you will do first of all look at the patient find out what are the symptoms typical symptoms you know dyspnea fatigue edema okay dyspnea fatigue edema along with these symptoms there are some more very very important symptoms which would directly you know i um, mean directing you directly to the heart failure and those symptoms are orthopnea and p and d okay orthopnea and p and d so orthopnea is you know nothing but when you are sleeping you are usually uh, you know the breathlessness during the sleep okay breathlessness during the sleep okay and proximal nocturnal dyspnea also is one of the same kind but proximal uh, you know pro proximal uh, nocturnal dyspnea is associated with um, Uh, you know your sleep disorder also sleep disorder also and one of the important uh, you know symptom of uh, heart failure also so orthopnea is normal when you have breathlessness during sleep okay and proctor uh, you know proximal nocturnal dyspnea is when you don't get the proper breath at 90% level so in pnd to avoid the pnd you usually keep the pillows down your neck okay so the number of pillows increases with the time increases with the severity understand guys remember this in pnd and orthopnea the number of pillows increases with the severity of heart failure once you are sleeping at 90% uh, i mean sorry 90 degree uh, normal like lying down then it's normal and uh, and when you are needing to hold your breath to control your breath or to control your breathlessness this if you need more pillows if you have to uh, you know increase the level of your angle while sleeping that means you have suspected heart failure so pnd and orthopnea i mean uh, these are two major symptoms again for the heart failure so if someone comes with the dyspnea fatigue uh, you know edema orthopnea or pnd 
so um, i mean um, either one or two or more than two uh, symptoms then you should always the first thing first thing is seek the evidence of underlying heart diseases to confirm that if the patient uh, you know developed any kind of heart attack recently patient has any kind of uh, uh, you know has underwent uh, any kind of cardiac surgery in childhood or uh, you know in the recent past or maybe the patient had you know any kind of uh, rheumatic heart disease or any kind of valvular heart problem so always look for the underlying heart diseases and if you are connecting any kind of underlying heart disease with these symptoms then definitely go for the proper diagnosis with the sign and symptoms uh, not symptoms with the signs signs are like again you know as you know that raised jugular vein pressures murmur uh, i mean those uh, crackles and peripheral edema or uh, you know the oxygen saturation i mean the breathlessness the oxygen saturation is less than 94% on the air tachypnea tachypnea means means your uh, you know raised uh, uh, you know respiratory rate more than 18 per minute more than 18 uh, you know uh, respiratory per uh, inhalations per minute or maybe tachycardia tachycardia is more than 100 uh, you know beats per minute your heart rate so these could be the vital signs and clinical examinations for heart failure and you should definitely then go for heart imaging or uh, you know electrical activities like electrocardiogram ecg we call it or chest x ray in chest x ray you will definitely find the cardiac anomalies or you know the cardiac uh, what we say enlargement you can see in the x ray or in echo as i told you echo is one of the important uh, you know very important uh, tool to diagnose heart failure like to check ejection fraction to check left ventricular enlargement to check lvh uh, you know left atrial enlargement or you know left ventricular hypertrophy or any kind of cardiac problems you can check by the echo okay and the relevant history as i told you underlying heart disease you can look for previous myocardial infarction you can look for angina heart uh, you know hypertension you can look for valvular problems you can look for metabolic or autoimmune diseases like uh, you know diabetes also obesity you can check and blood test definitely bnp or antiprotein because this is the one a signature biomarker for heart failure you can go for full blood count to check whether the patient is in anemia because see anemia is one of the major etiology for heart failure guys and heart failure is one of the major etiology for anemia so anemia always correlates with heart failure if the patient is in heart failure or patient is anemia it could be due to uh, you know like uh, heart failure could be due to anemia also so go for full blood count check for anemia and renal functions if the renal insufficiency is there that means it has activated your rest system always check for serum creatinine sodium potassium okay and bun b u n you know blood urea nitrates okay and then go for liver functions because liver conditions are also one of the major uh, you know etiologies for heart failure okay raised bilirubin uh, sorry not raised bilirubin uh, raised albumin okay raised albumin is one of the uh, you know uh, like additional Uh, diagnosis for your uh, heart failure okay and then thyroid functions of course thyroid functions as you know thyroid functions are you know uh, major uh, uh, you know functions or major uh, you know activities in the body which actually activates your sympathetic nervous system okay and it usually you know directly plays with your heart you know it directly plays with your heart so thyroid functions also you know must be checked during your heart failure okay and uh, so this is how you can you know diagnose a heart failure patients easily okay if someone comes with heart failure you can diagnose them easily with these proper channels proper tools and signs and symptoms okay guys okay so i'll take the questions here before going to the next slide mm. bnp is released from the heart valves right then why it is called brain <laughs> okay that that you that you must read uh, rinta Uh, you must read yourself why it is called brain natriuretic peptide this is not exactly brain natriuretic peptide but this is the stimulate this is the this is caused by stimulation the uh, you know the secretion of the bnp secretion of this hormone is or this peptide is due to the brain stimulation just check it and read it okay and tell me that also later no problem so do we do we use tee for detailed investigation of heart failure tea is trans thoracic Uh, that is tte that is uh, you know trans esophageal echocardiogram guys this te afrin sake is talking about trans esophageal echocardiogram okay and there is one more called tte trans thoracic echocardiogram okay so these things are nothing these things are nothing 
but the extended version of your echocardiograms usually the 2d or 3d echocardiograms are external scans okay are external scans where we put the probe at your heart and we check what's going on inside but when we talk about tee and tte that means they put the probe through your you know uh, through your uh, gi through your gastrointestinal tract they put the uh, probe inside and then they look the picture of the heart from inside okay usually tee is not for heart failure tee is for you know uh, fibrosis or tee is for pulmonary edema tee is for uh, you know usually congenital heart problems tee is for uh, you know any kind of uh, what we say is carotid uh, um, i forgot the conditions here guys tee could be additionally a support for heart failure why will say it could be a support but it is not something which is necessary to do or which is a proper diagnostic tool for heart failure it could be additionally uh, you know a help to find out the underlying problems of heart failure okay but not exactly the thing adrenal insufficiency lead to heart failure yes sarinath yes adrenal insufficiency leads to heart failure why liver functions in c uh, okay it's uh, is seen in heart failure diagnosis that is again a question for you guys i i told you already you must check the albumin and how this is again a question for all of you guys you can discuss this how albumin is or how liver functions are associated with heart failure this is one of the major question one of the major thing also i told you this is associated and we must check albumin and how albumin is associated with that that is your task to find out okay NPs are mostly made in pituitary hypothalamus. Okay, so is uh, sir in obese women, how much water must be in taken in day? See, <laughs> this is not about don't get confused that you should not take proper intake of water. Proper hydration is important. Okay, proper hydration is important every day. You must not go to dehydration state, guys. Okay, you must not go to dehydration state at all because dehydration can cause multiple problems. okay it can cause anemia it can cause you migraine it can cause you another problems multiple problems it can cause so must not go to dehydration but you should not be something you know who is just drinking water drinking water every time so it is usually you know the recommended there are the recommendations you know there are the recommendations for water intake like you know 2 uh, to 3 liters in women and 4 to 5 liters uh, i mean 4 to 5 liters in uh, you know men and in pregnant women it is quite more so there are the things okay there are the recommendations normal healthy persons can even drink more water that's okay but that more restriction uh, you know the if you uh, follow the recommendations that's okay that's that's really good okay increased albumin increased oncotopic pressure fluid retention increased preload heart failure see uh, someone has found and uh, right here anna that's nice okay netranjali has is symptoms in symptoms it's dyspnea and diagnosis it's tachypnea okay <laughs> no see dyspnea what is dyspnea dyspnea is breathlessness you know dyspnea is breathlessness like a you know unusual abnormal breath okay that is unusual breath abnormal breath breathlessness is also tachypnea breathlessness means the number of your breaths has been increased okay tachypnea is one of the you know type or we can say another uh, you know functional state of uh you know your uh, dyspnea okay these are the different functional state of your respiratory functions one sec i'll just uh, put on my chart yeah so these are just functional state of your respiratory system nothing else okay so do not uh you know uh, worry about it yeah so this is the diagnosis okay let's go to the management system now perfect we have come to the management system of heart failure okay so what are the goals before going to the treatment pattern we must know the goals okay i will tell you guys one thing here you must be careful okay you must be careful with the statement what i am going to make here there is no 100% treatment for heart failure okay there is no 100% treatment for heart failure patients can recover from the state 100% okay there is no 100% treatment for heart failure because that is that was actually a reversible state when we were talking about physio uh, you know pathophysiology heart failure 
was a non reversible changes okay non reversible changes okay so that is called uh, you know if you check let me let me take you to the thing okay physiology check negative remodeling so that was the remodeling or the uh, you know the changes in the heart wall changes in the heart structure was irreversible still it is irreversible there are some drugs which claims that claims that you know those drugs can be helpful in positive remodeling like enalapril okay like enalapril i'm talking about enalapril like secubitril valsartan these are the new drugs and these are the first choice now you know enalapril means ace inhibitors are the first choice for heart failures okay first choice for hypertension first choice for heart failure first choice almost first choice after aspirin and antiplatelets for heart attack also these are the drugs which could be helpful which could be a positive remod for the positive remodeling but there is no 100% remodeling possible for heart failure patients it is the symptoms could be recovered signs could be recovered but there is no heart 100% remodeling possible remember this okay so we usually focus on the goals which include to improve the clinical status means symptomatic relief only symptomatic relief to improve the health related quality of life and functional capacity to improve the sign and symptoms remember this to improve the symptomatic relief i mean to improve the clinical status means symptoms to improve the health related quality of life health related what is health related quality of life means to alleviate the symptoms and signs from the patient understand that and then to prevent the frequent rehospitalization if you control the signs and symptoms if you improve in the signs and symptoms if you alleviate signs and symptoms you will definitely stop the frequent rehospitalization because frequent rehospitalization is one of the major outcome in heart failure patients understand that and then to reduce the mortality because reduce because mortality is the ultimate truth in heart failure patients maybe in one year 10 year 5 years 6 years 10 year 15 years not 15 years 15 years i'm talking a little large you know maybe 5 years 6 years 10 years maximum you know if they are if they are taking care of them very properly 5 to 10 years maximum otherwise no okay i mean that is true right guys and then of course non pharmacological managements are there after goals if we come to the pharmacological non pharmacological treatments non pharmacological managements there is a fluid intake management as i told you daily fluid intake must be monitored if the patient is on proper medicine patient is on proper treatment proper therapy after that you must check the fluid intake every day you know what we suggest we suggest one and half times more fluid of the excretion of first day the output of the first day if the patient is secreting if the patient is excreting like the urine output is 1 liter today then patient gets only 1 and 1/2 liter fluid tomorrow okay patient gets only 1 and 1/2 liter fluid tomorrow that includes total water intake chai coffee milk everything every fluid must be restricted to 1.5 if the urine output today is 2 liter then the uh, fluid intake must be 3 liter tomorrow that is one and half times more that is the better formula for fluid intake and fluid measurement and management it must be very cautious every day sodium restriction as i told you sodium must be restricted completely controlled i mean not totally uh, you know uh, restricted from the food but only limited in the patients with heart failure it should be cut off to 50% or less obesity control is very important after getting heart failure stage 2 or stage 3 obesity control is not possible so it is possible when you are in early stages of heart failure or when you are healthy you must control the obesity nutritional management is important because anemia is one of the major comorbidity of heart failure rehabilitation means the you know increasing breath exercises yoga and you know pranayam these things are very important in heart failure these things gives the best results in heart failure lifestyle modifications you can definitely start you know your lifestyle modifications walk no sedentary lifestyle at least daily walk uh, you know pranayam yoga lifestyle modifications means food restrictions uh, fluid intake management everything 
Okay, so these are the major non-pharmacological management skills. Okay, let's come to the other managements. Additive therapies, therapies. There are the you know CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. When the patient has orthopnea or PND symptoms, then they must go for these supplemental oxygen uh, you know things. And vaccinations are very important for heart failure patients. Annual vaccinations are very important for influenza and for pneumonia. Guys, remember this. Little, no one will tell you. These vaccinations are very important because there are, as I told you, inflammation is one of the major etiology. Okay, so if the patient gets infections, they, there is, uh, you know, that there are, there are no stoppage from the, you know, very, very wrong outcomes. So always look for vaccinations in heart failure patients. If they get heart failure, they must be vaccinated every year for influenza and pneumonia at least. Surgical treatments, there are multiple surgical treatments like heart transplantation at the end. Ventricular restoration, very, very costly. Heart transplantation, ventricular restoration are like, you know, crores, okay, in crores. And after the crores also, there are the chances of rejection very high, more than 50% rejection chances. And again, the mortality will be very, very high, more than 50% mortality for two years to five years. So after heart transplantation or ventricular restoration also, patients will live for two to five years. Okay, then cardiac support devices. Revascularization and vascular correction means the patient, if the patient has come with, come up with the heart attack, come up with the vascular problems, come up with the valvular problems, they should be corrected immediately. These are the surgical procedures or revascularization suggested in the patients with comorbidities. Okay. So let me take the questions here. Uh, okay. Someone is asking the question here. Sir, in NYHA 4, can the patient go for heart transplantation oh no 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 heart transplantation is not the first thing heart transplantation is the last thing after bridging therapy after bridging therapy okay bridging therapy i'll tell you what is bridging therapy bridging therapy means when the heart starts you know uh, deteriorating even on the even when the patient is on the inotropes even the patient is on all the therapies triple therapies with inotropes and diuretics if the patient is not recovering after that also then you can think of heart transplantation. And in India itself, there are more than 800 heart transplantations pending. Why? Because there is no donor. There are no donor. There are no uh, fundings. I mean, that heart, um, you know, 800, more than 800 heart transplantations are pending who have the money, but they are not getting the donor. Okay, otherwise there are the, you know, millions of the people who are looking for heart transplantations, lung transplantations, but they do not have the resources at all, right? So uh, definitely not, NIH class four is not an indication at all for heart transplantation, not at all, okay? Remember this, NIH four is not at all an indication for heart transplant. Heart transplant indication is therapy. When the patient is not recovering uh, from the symptoms and signs, even on the triple therapy, triple therapy means uh, ACE inhibitors, NGO uh, ACE inhibitors and, uh, you know, Along with that, ARBs, along with that, mineralocorticoid steroids, I mean, the, you know, uh, spironolactone, lactone, and along with that, diuretics, and all the problematic inotropes. Okay, so if the patient is not recovering by those also, at the end stays, at the end stays, then only we go for heart transplant. Okay. What about the treatment provided during the golden hours of MI? Of course, it will. It will stop the patient, uh, you know, leading to the heart failure, definitely. Sacrobital ulcer are RNA blockers, sacrobital valsartan, as I told you, these are the newer combinations. They are, these drugs are, I mean, the sacrobital valsartan combination is a very promising drug because I have been involved in the, even the clinical trials. We did the, you know, landmark clinical trials in India, like Paradise, Paradagon, uh, you know, Paragon trials for these drugs in India. And those were really successful and they are, uh, you know, they, they are very good for, uh, you know, improving the lifestyle, improving the health related lifestyle, health, health related quality of life. Okay. But still they are, I mean, they are showing some, uh, you know, uh, percentage of uh, positive remodeling also, but still the, you know, trials are going on on the remodeling. The first thing in when we are launching the, heart, when, when we are launching the, you know, any drug for heart failure, the first goal is to improve the sign and symptoms. So, Shakuntal Valsatana is really good for, you know, uh, to improve the related, uh, you know, health related quality of life to reduce the, you know, uh, hospitalizations and all. Yes, uh, Anishati, I'll come to that. 
what would be the cardiac supported devices i'll tell you there are the uh, you know icds intracardiac defibrillators implantable cardiac defibrillators okay i'll come to that what would right sided heart failure and left sided heart failure okay that's very important question what is right sided heart failure and left sided heart failure so this is the failure of ventricles if the right right ventricle is failed and heart is not able to pump the proper proper blood to the uh you know lungs and is not able to take the proper blood from the lungs then there is uh, impure blood in your body and that can cause the heart failure that is um, i mean one of the type of heart failure right side heart failure and left side heart failure is major and 90% of the heart failure is left sided heart failure that is called left ventricular heart failure okay Ooh. what is the emergency management for patients coming to casualty with symptoms diuretics diuretics ampla empagliflozin these okay so guys you are going to the diabetic drugs diabetic drugs means which are promising in the heart failure also dpp4 inhibitors so dpp4 inhibitors and uh, you know these drugs are uh, you know uh, good actually uh, nowadays they are really good in heart failure they are showing the very promising results in heart failure and even given but uh, you know these are very 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 new uh, i must tell you empagliflozin dapagliflozin and uh, you know uh these drugs uh, are very new okay so drugs uh, still the research is going on their trials are recently out in the covid and all yeah why diuretics used in emergency management because we have to relieve the symptoms and the symptoms will be relieved by uh, you know increasing the output when there is a fluid overload in the body where there is a fluid overload in your lungs where there is a pulmonary edema then we our first task is to reduce the uh, you know fluid through your body i mean to eliminate the fluid from your body to reduce the fluid overload in your body and that's why we use diuretics to increase your urine secretion okay to decrease the patient's urine secretion so patients will be coming under the uh i mean uh, that stays uh, where overload will not be there okay drugs management discussing of course discussing that is the next task see here that is the slide major slide i want to discuss with you guys why i am here to discuss everything okay so you just tell me what to discuss about heart failure okay so this is the pharmacological algorithm guys okay if the patient is coming to you with the symptomatic heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction or even the uh, you know the preserved ejection fraction see look at the first emergency treatments okay i'll tell you about the emergency treatment diuretics to relieve the symptoms and signs of congestion in emergency are important these are not first or second line of therapy these are the emergency treatments for congestion congestion means overload fluid overload in your body in the emergency diuretics must be used okay and if the lvef lvef means left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 35% despite optimal medical therapy optimal medical therapy means this despite optimal medical therapy or a history of symptomatic uh, you know vn or uh, vf ventricular tachycardia or you know ventricular uh, fibrillation uh, we always should consider imp uh, to implant the icd icd is implantable cardiac defibrillator i'll talk about that later but if the patient see if the patient is coming to the emergency diuretics to relieve the signs and symptoms if the patient's ef is 35 or less then and i mean along with the 35 and less if the patient have symptomatic ventricular tachycardia or symptomatic ventricular fibrillation then we must go for icd because icd controls the conduction system icd controls the ventricular tachycardias and it is important in heart failure and it improves the ventricular ejection fraction also So, so these are the indications for icd icd is not helpful in everyone icd means this intra uh, you know implantable cardiac defibrillation that is in case of tachycardias when the patient is having tachycardias or tachycardia induced heart failure okay so in that case we need icd now let's come to the normal treatment okay normal uh, uh, algorithm so when the patient comes with the uh, symptoms first therapy is ACE inhibitors or beta blockers and beta blockers. These are the first choice of drugs. Okay, these are the first choice of drugs: ACE inhibitors and beta blocker. 
so first give one drug or these two drugs one drug ACE inhibitors enough or beta blockers enough or we can give these two drugs if the patient is symptomatic with the uh, you know NYHE class 2a or 3 okay so in that case we should always go with these two drugs and we should up titrate to the maximum tolerated evidence based doses we should start with slow dose we should up titrate to the maximum dose like suppose if i'm giving enalapril i can start with 2.5 mg and i can try enalapril up to 10 mg okay if i am giving beta blockers like um, giving uh, you know suppose metoprolol i can start with 12.5 mg i can go up to 50 mg or 100 mg okay that is the maximum tolerated doses if we if we talk about the maximum tolerated doses we should go up to maximum tolerated doses okay so the first line of the drug in heart failure now according to 2017 guidelines according to 2021 guidelines these are the first line therapies ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and now if the patient is still having the symptoms and lbf is less than 35 percent then we should add mr antagonist mineralocorticoids receptor antagonist that is spironolactone okay that is spironolactone we should uh, add to this that is called a dual therapy now one is ACE inhibitors first line therapy and second line therapy that's called dual therapy now the dual patient is on dual therapy and if the patient is still showing symptoms up titrate the spironolactone or aplanonone okay the aplanonone is again you know another uh, you know uh, what we say mr antagonist so you can go up to that you know highest dose and if the patient is still in the symptoms or uh, and lvf is less than 35 percent then add another drug whether it is uh, you know whether it is uh, <clears throat> uh, you know uh, if the patient is in you know uh, heart rate with the uh, i mean the high heart rate then you can add ivabradine but you have to cut the beta blocker because beta blockers and ivabradine has the same effect on you know uh, your rhythms your heart rates both reduces your heart rates so either beta blocker or ivabradine we can add ivabradine we can cut off the beta blocker if the patient is on is not on beta blocker we can add ivabradine here or we can go for you know different if the patient is in different i mean there are different different conditions now if the patient is able to tolerate ace inhibitors then arni can be replaced okay i mean arni can replace the ace so here you can replace the ace inhibitors by arni arni as we are talking about cyclobutyl valsartan so you know we can uh, we can uh, definitely replace uh, ace inhibitors because any ace inhibitors has only one ace uh, you know one nl april or if it is arb also i mean ace or arb the same thing i mean if ace is not there then arb if the patient who cannot tolerate the ace inhibitors they can go for arbs arbs are valsartan you know uh, valsartan and tell me sartan and all me sartan there are multiple uh, you know sartans so if the patient is on only one ace inhibitors or arb then we can replace with arni okay and if the patient is on beta blockers, we can replace with ibuprofen, and we can think for CRT also, cardiac recognition, re, uh, you know, resynchronization therapy. You know, uh, I mean, in the case of when the patient is having sinus rhythm, but QRS duration is more than 130 milliseconds. Okay, that is a different conditions. I mean, 130 milliseconds in the ECG, we check QRS duration means the pause, and if the pause is more than 130 milliseconds, we should always think for CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, along with the drugs. So here, think of one. I'll, I'll uh, you know, one in one sentence. I'll summarize. If the patient comes with heart failure, they start with ACE inhibitors or beta blockers, along with beta. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I mean ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. Okay. If the patient is not tolerating ACE inhibitors, we can replace by ARBs here only. Okay. The first line therapy, ACE inhibitors or ARBs with or without beta blocker. Second you know line therapy we can add mr antagonist which is spironolactone or aplanon if the patient is still not well then we can replace ace or arb by arni because it has arb and it has the psychobutyl okay and in that case if the patient is having high heart rate like more than 70 beats per minute we can replace beta blocker also with ibuprofen Okay, so this is the normal therapy. This is the normal pharmacological treatment algorithm. But the still, but still, if the patient is in resistant symptoms, then we can consider digoxin. Okay, we can consider digoxin 
and we can go for heart transplantation as i told you we can go for heart transplantation right we can go for heart transplantation right this is the indication when every pharmacological therapy is failed then we can go for the heart transplant or lved lved is left ventricular assisted devices okay so i'll take the questions before going to that but why is amlodipine given first in hospital oh wow. god hi amlodipine is not at all recommended now amlodipine is not at all recommended for uh, you know according to guidelines according to guidelines it's not recommended heart failure patients to so definitely not ccbs are not required ccbs are not given because ccbs accumulate the fluid in the body can did you read about amlodipine induced pedal edema did you read about ccb induced pedal edema there is a major side effect of amlodipine we must not give ccbs in heart failure patients at all ccbs are given for heart uh, hypertension not heart failure guys come on why you not at all yes is this guidelines algorithm any particular guidelines yes esc european society of Cardio cardiology guidelines 2021 these guidelines have been taken from european society of cardiology guidelines 2021 uh aparna is asking is spironolactone avoided because its hormonal side effects no patient if the patient see now here you have to consider these things guys risk benefit ratio if the risk is higher than benefit you must not give the drug but if the benefit is more than risk always go for the drug don't look at the uh, you know side effects or don't look at the if the side effects are really major and you think that it could be you know the disease could be controlled without the drug then definitely not why we are giving spironolactone we are giving spironolactone because heart failure is not controlled by the first line therapies right yes great okay thank you guys so this is the algorithm now this is the implantable cardiovascular cardioverter defibrillator implantable cardioverter defibrillator you can see this is the uh, machine i mean the proper uh, this is the pulse generator i mean the whole thing is called icd okay this is inside this is uh, i mean uh, just for the sample purpose outside this is pulse generator these are the leads which goes which goes to your right atrium and right ventricle because there is the generating point for atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia atrial tachycardias so it controls the strokes strokes means not that stroke disease strokes of the blood stroke of the conduction okay it stops the strokes of the conduction it controls the conduction system from here okay and it maintains the proper contraction and relaxation of the heart valves of the ventricular valves so it controls the heart failure uh, that way okay there's the work of icd implantable cardioverter cardioverter defibrillator and remember guys there is a condition when ejection fraction is less than 35 and patient has vt or vf ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation then it is indicated then only it is indicated okay so uh, comorbidities there are multiple comorbidities in heart failure like uh, you know copd you can uh, always mimic the heart failure with the you know copd and uh, uh, you know the comorbidities can increase the burden of hospitalizations mortality worsening the heart failure symptoms like copd you cannot you know define exact symptoms and uh, comorbidities can impair the quality of life in heart failure patients it can affect the treatment of heart failure because you need multiple tablets uh, okay and interaction with the drugs as we are giving you know polypharmacy so comorbidities are very very uh, you know tough to handle in heart failure patients like myocardial infarction hypertension asthma copd i'm so sorry guys okay asthma copd multiple things are there okay so these are the comorbidities angina heart failure uh, heart attack hypertension diabetes iron deficiency anemia hypokalemia hyperkalemia central nervous system problems kidney functions cancer lung disease sleep disturbances obesity valvular heart problems these are the major comorbidities which are found with heart failure and that's why you know these makes the heart failure complex okay and now understand the magnitude of the problem burden of the heart failure in india is approximately 2 to 5 million with the estimation estimated prevalence of 2 to 3 per 1000 population 
heart failure is responsible for 1.8 million admissions annually 18 lakh admissions annually are caused by heart failure in india indian heart failure patients are younger with the mean age of 53 years against 69 years in europe and us so in europe and us the heart failure patients are much older than indian patients in india that means in india patients are getting patients are developing heart failure at the age of 53 years only due to any reason there are the certain reasons diabetes hypertension sedentary lifestyle office work stress multiple things but patients are getting heart failure at the at the young age okay the in hospital mortality rate in india is 10 to 30% against 4 to 7% in us and europe if the patient comes with heart failure to the hospital their chances of death are 10 to 30% against the europe and us where it is just 4 to 7% okay prevalence of heart failure is escalating even after optimal management policies the current burden worldwide is 3% and uh, you know you can see the references down okay guys so this is just a comparative data uh, from different different uh, you know uh, registries including my registry also what we have done in india so you can see hypertension is one of the major comorbidity diabetes is also one of the major comorbidity and anemia is one of the major comorbidity in in etiologies 40% is done by ihd 24% by cardiomyopathies and again the hypertension 17% okay so these are the major comorbidities and other things in heart failure okay so you can see as i told you anemia and uh, so now questions for you guys um in class is over about uh, heart failure tomorrow we'll dis we'll discuss the case uh, again repeating the class but today let me uh, check your what we have discussed class is over priyanshi okay you can tell me yes uh, see for the pediatric patients also for the pediatric patients also management is same but we don't give the tablets we give the uh, you know injections of lasix injection of uh, you know drugs we usually go for other uh, management we have a little slight different management for that okay what are the typical symptoms of heart failure except oh guys come on the read the question first read the question first except four yes except angioedema yes except angioedema fatigue dyspnea pnd and pedal edema are the symptoms of heart failure angioedema is the side effect of can someone write angioedema is the side effect of angioedema is the side effect of ace inhibitors fantastic ACE inhibitors, not CCBs. Come on, who is writing CCBs? No, ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors. Okay, yes. Now this. Okay, who will give me the answer of this, guys? Come on, fast, fast. Now, if you give this answer correctly, I'll understand. You have learned a lot from today's class. So let me read this question for you. Correct, Fino. Then for systolic dysfunction, low ejection fraction, lesser amount of blood is pumped out. Low ejection fraction, normal amount of blood is pumped out. Normal ejection fraction and lesser amount of blood is pumped out. Normal ejection fraction and normal amount of blood is pumped out. Normal ejection fraction and lesser amount of blood is pumped out. My God, guys, you are killing me. Seriously. you guys were not in the class at all i am asking correct phenomenon of systolic function systolic function means always low ejection fraction how can you understand that how you are writing 3 when low ejection fraction and when we are talking about heart failure that of the blood so low ejection fraction and lesser amount of the blood is pumped that means the one is the correct answer okay next heart failure with preserved ejection fraction shows what heart failure with preserved ejection fraction guys please tell me 3 3 3 okay okay nice perfect 3 yeah correct 3 yes what is this 
tell me this guys tell me this not 33 3 okay tell me this remarkable limitation symptoms at routine activity comfortable at rest is nyha 3 yes absolutely 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 so oh yes again one more question is there heart failure oh again three yes again three okay okay so do we have any other question or it's done mm, yes that is again one question there is again one question icd stands for oh i think uh, i forgot to give the number to the questions every question is d every question is d okay so I, icd stands for what uh, implantable cardioverter degen degenerator okay implantable cardioverter cardioverter defibrillator perfect guys perfect so good so good okay so by this thank you guys for your patience and uh thank you if you have any questions you can ask and it was a wonderful class i hope you have learned a lot i really wish that you know you have learned really 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 good okay and uh, that was a nice class seriously i love teaching heart failure and cardiac problems you know whenever uh because this is my specialization guys so you can ask me any questions if you have now right now okay thank you very much and please do this assignment do those assignments whatever i told you Please do those things, okay? Do you remember what are those things what we have discussed? You can discuss in your classes. Mm, Janvi is asking how to assess first, second, and third degree heart blocks from ECG. Okay, I have considered this as a problem and I have come up with a very fantastic course with, you know, course on ECGs. We are launching soon in a week. We are launching the course on ECGs. Very great course by top cardiologists in India, top electrophysiologists in India. For certificate, we have to give exam. Yes, for the certificate, you have to give exam. Yes, definitely. Yes, I will definitely, Srians. I'll, I'll, I'll include SGLT2 inhibitors tomorrow. Okay, I will include in tomorrow's class because today it's almost two hours of the class. I didn't realize, guys. I didn't realize. I cannot reduce. See, sir, please reduce the time as local people left college at 6 p.m. and would did not have time for our course. Okay. Okay, Sundra Salim, I'll take this question for two minutes, guys. Uh, Sundra Salim has a very good question. Sir, could you please tell us what are the what are the different symptoms which occurs in CCF and heart failure? CCF is the stage of heart failure. CCF is the acute stage of heart failure when patient suddenly gets the problem, suddenly gets the breathlessness, suddenly gets the fluid overload, and that is due to the pulmonary edema. That is due to the fluid accumulation accumulation in the lungs. Okay. That is the condition called, you know, congestive heart failure or CHF or CCF. This same thing. Okay, heart failure and CCF are not different thing. This is just a condition, just an just a stage of heart failure. CCF or CHF is just a heart failure, uh, you know, stage, severe stage we can say. Okay, where the patient gets the pulmonary edema, and the pulmonary edema means the swelling of the pulmonary arteries okay and that is why because that is why because fluid is accumulated in your lungs okay alveolize no not at all ccf cannot be considered as right side heart failure or left side heart failure no ccf is ccf this is the acute phase of heart failure uh beta blockers do not worsen heart failure at all Sometimes, if you have the underlying conditions, definitely. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Charlie, take care and have a nice dinner and have a good night, guys. Thank you very much. Take care. See you guys on uh, next Friday. Or maybe we can have a class on Sunday also. If I'm free, I'll let you know in the, in the groups. We can discuss. We can have a class on Sunday also. Okay, guys. So take care. 
great good night guys okay um someone has a very good comment here Sanskar, I'm not sure yeah, about Chetinad Hospital and Research Institute. I'm not sure about the path. I'm not sure seriously. I don't know the people there much. 